Attorney General William Barr says the Justice Department has failed to uncover any evidence of widespread voting fraud, which would change the outcome of the presidential election. Barr had authorized U.S. attorneys to pursue any substantial allegations of fraud last month, despite no evidence any had occurred. The comments today are in direct opposition to President Trump's repeated, unfounded claims the election was somehow rigged. According to the New York Times, the Trump campaign has raised $170 million in the four weeks since Election Day for what they're calling an election defense fund. In reality, three-quarters of every contribution goes to the president's new political action committee. A donor has to give $5,000 to the group before any funds go toward recount efforts. Meanwhile, lawmakers are back in session after their Thanksgiving break, bringing with them rekindled hope for the next phase of coronavirus aid before more key benefits expire. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin discussed a potential coronavirus package this afternoon for the first time since October as part of a conversation on the upcoming government funding deadline. We'll have more later this hour on some new proposals making the rounds on Capitol Hill. But the clock is ticking. About 12 million people nationwide will lose their unemployment benefits on December 26th if nothing is passed. On top of that, a ban on certain rent evictions and deferment on federal student loan repayments both expire when the calendar turns to 2021. President-elect Joe Biden pressed the need for a comprehensive aid package when introducing his administration's economic team this afternoon. Right now, the full Congress should come together and pass a robust package for relief to address these urgent needs. But any package passed in a lame duck session is likely to be at best just a start. My transition team is already working on what I'll put forward in the next Congress to address the multiple crises we're facing, especially our economic and COVID crises. The coronavirus is spreading at an alarming rate in the U.S., but there have been some signs of optimism when it comes to the vaccine front. CBS News has obtained estimates from the government's Operation Warp Speed. It predicts states will begin receiving Pfizer's vaccine in two weeks, with Moderna's initial wave of vaccinations coming later this month. The U.S. saw 4 million new coronavirus cases in the month of November alone. Hospitalizations remain at a record high, with 96,000 people nationwide as of last night. Close to 20 percent of those hospitalized are being treated in intensive care units. Ed O'Keefe and Elena Treen join me now. Ed is a CBS News political correspondent with President-elect Biden in Delaware. And Elena is a White House reporter for Axios. Welcome. It's good to see you both. So, Ed, the attorney general is directly contradicting the president's unfounded claims of election fraud. At this point, does it seem the president's continued fight on this is solely a political strategy, not a legal one? Uh, yes, uh, frankly, uh, Elaine, that, that is essentially all it is at this point. Uh, you know, he, he has tried to use every single lever at his disposal, putting his Justice Department on the case, putting Republican governors and state lawmakers on the case, and all of them have come back to him essentially at this point and said, there's nothing there, sir. Uh, obviously, that is not the answer he's looking for. His campaign this afternoon saying, with all due respect to Barr, they have examples of improprieties and fraud that they intend to continue introducing in court. But as we've seen time and time again in several different states, those cases are ruled to have no merit and are being tossed out by judges. And in some cases, federal judges that were nominated to the bench by the president and confirmed in recent years by the Republican-controlled Senate. So, you know, as you pointed out there, this is a fundraising mechanism, not only for him, but for the party more broadly. I'm told that not only is it the 130 or 150 million raised so far necessarily for him or for his political entities and, and the legal defense fund, but it's also hundreds of millions of, you know, on top of that, millions more for the ongoing uh, runoff races in Georgia and potential legal challenges after those two contests on January 5th as well. So really, all of this is just in many ways driving 
uh, the ongoing political operation of the president that is very likely to continue beyond January 20th as he considers his options comes 2024. Well, Elena, I want to ask about the timing of this. Shortly after this interview came out, the attorney general was visiting the White House and announcing the appointment of a new special counsel into the origins of the Russia probe. What more can you tell us? Well, Elaine, the timing of this is all very interesting. And uh, I did speak with people at the Department of Justice shortly after the news came out. Uh, and I saw that a spokesman for Attorney General Bill Barr released this as well. But apparently, Attorney General Barr was already planning to go to the White House before any of the uh, before the interview with the AP uh, came out for a pre-scheduled meeting. He wasn't meeting with President Trump. Um, and so I, as I've heard from right before I came on speak with my White House contacts, he hasn't met with Trump today. So uh, that could change. But I do think there is a ton of frustration around his comments to the AP. Um, and then the news about him appointing special, a special counsel to investigate the origins of the probe uh, Kind of seems like cover, but I think the key thing here is the timing of that. He had pointed John Durham, who had already been investigating the origins of the Russian investigation. Um, he did this appointment as special counsel in October, and so long before the election. And he decided, Barr says in his letter, uh, which he released later to the committees of the House and Senate Judiciary Committee, he sent that over to them today. He said he waited to release that letter and announced this publicly because of the proximity of appointing Durham a special counselor to the election. And so the timing is interesting. Of course, I think reporters like myself and Ed, who have been covering this administration uh, for the past several years now, know that the president probably would have liked him to be announced a special counselor prior to the election. And so I'm, I'm definitely trying to continue to report this out with my contacts in the White House to see what the president's reaction is. I do think that the statement that was released by his legal team, Rudy Giuliani and Jella Ellis, in response to the interview with the AP and him rejecting these so far baseless claims of widespread voter fraud does show the level of tension that there is now between the White House, the Trump campaign, and the Department of Justice. Um, but as of now, I think still waiting to see exactly what repercussions might come from that interview. Yes, and we'll be keeping a close eye, as always, on the president's Twitter feed. In the meantime, Ed, we see President-elect Biden putting together more of his administration, including the potential appointees to deal with this pandemic economy. Are they optimistic at all about where the country will be when they take over on January 20th? I think they'll be more optimistic if Congress is able to cut some kind of a deal before the recess for the holidays uh, and, and at least provide limited or short-term relief to businesses, to states and cities potentially, and just generally try to address the economic pain that so many are still enduring. He said today in his remarks here in Wilmington that if Congress does something by the end of the year, that's great, but they should be anticipating much more activity next year, saying that his transition team is already beginning to put together a potential aid package and economic stimulus kind of uh, proposals that would be considered by Congress once he takes office in late January. And doing that while introducing his Treasury Secretary nominee, his nominee to lead the White House Budget Office, and his top economic advisors, it was all sort of packaged together as, as an example of how he is ready uh, to take this on once he takes over. But it came on the same day as this bipartisan agreement was reached and as the Senate Majority Leader was releasing some thoughts of his own on what potentially could be done after he signaled yesterday that he now understands this needs to be addressed before Christmas. A lot of people are probably wondering, well, what took so long? Frankly, you know, calendars mm -hmm. and, and the fact that there are fewer days on them have a real way of compelling lawmakers in both parties and in both chambers to get things done. And we're going to see a pretty healthy bit of activity in the next two weeks. But even then, it won't be enough for the new president. Yeah, I mean, it would not be the first time, certainly, that we have seen a rush to action in this month of December before that holiday recess. Um, so, Ed, let me also ask you, Republicans are already signaling opposition to some of the president-elect's picks, specifically near a tandem, Mr. Biden's choice to lead the Office of Management and Budget. Let's listen to South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. If you want to stop this nonsense, if you want to make sure this nut job Tandon doesn't become the director of the budget in charge of the Office of Management and Budget, then make sure we win in Georgia. 
All right. So why is this nomination controversial, Ed, and what does it tell us about how willing Republicans are to work with the incoming Biden administration? Well, the, the, the reason, they're, they're not going to say it necessarily explicitly, at least not yet, but look, she is the head of the Center for American Progress, a liberal think tank in Washington, one of the more prominent anti-Trump, anti-Republican establishments there is in our nation's capital, and she's been a very prominent, outspoken critic of the president and of several specific Republican lawmakers, many of them in the Senate. When she was announced earlier this week, they suddenly went, oh, well, you know, this is somebody who's been tweeting a lot of nasty things about us, to which Democrats turned right around and said, where have you been for the last five years? You have a president hmm. who says disparaging things not only about Democrats, but also about a lot of you. So if you got an issue with this, take it up with the president. One thing you saw her do today in her remarks here in Delaware is something that I think we're going to see her, the Biden team, and Democrats overall continue to make, is that she comes to this job not only as somebody who's worked for the Clinton and Obama administrations, the Clinton and Obama campaigns, and has run this major think tank for the last several years and clearly has professional political chops that they're going to work to somewhat downplay, but what they're going to emphasize more is that they believe she has real-world experience and understanding of what goes or what happens once a budget is set and passed and implemented across the country. She played up the fact that her mother, an immigrant from India, much like Kamala Harris's mother, came to this country, divorced her husband, stayed in suburban Boston. After that divorce, was dependent for a while on federally subsidized housing and food stamps. And she made the point that she is a byproduct, essentially, of smart federal budgeting uh, and a country and a government that was willing to give her mother a leg up. And so she is going to bring those experiences, she says, to this. That may be Pollyannish for some. That is something that certainly a lot of people, especially fans of the Biden-Harris administration, are going to love to hear. Uh, but it's that kind of an emphasis, the sort of real-world understanding and impact that these people can have by doing the work they do in Washington that they will continue to make over the next several weeks and potentially months as this drags out to test whether or not Republicans really want to stand in the way. But so far, she and maybe only the other one is Anthony Blinken, the state, uh, Secretary of State nominee, have seen a notable level of Republican, at least skepticism, if not outright opposition. And the issue, you heard Lindsey Graham mention Georgia, is will Republicans have control of the Senate after those Georgia elections or will they not? And if they do, do they refuse to hold hearings on some of Biden's nominees, which would essentially force him to withdraw those nominations and put up somebody else? Some of them are signaling that's what they'd like in the case of near attendance. All right. So, Elena, for those viewers who may be tuning into Red and Blue for the first time, let us once again remind people about Georgia. It seems as though we have been talking about it now nonstop, but it matters because control of the Senate comes down to these runoffs. So if Democrats win both runoffs on January 5th, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris becomes the tie-breaking vote in their favor. If Republicans win, they retain the ability to block the Biden agenda. Now, you also have some new reporting, I understand on Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer's regrets about this past election. What can you tell us about that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, my colleague and I reported last evening that Senator Schumer, in, in calls with donors privately, of course, after any election, uh, donors have a lot of questions about why races went a certain way. Uh, in this case, this year, a lot of Senate seats uh, that Democrats had hoped to pick up, they didn't. They either remained Republican um, and or flipped Republican. And so um, th these are some of those calls that Senator Schumer had with these donors. And some of the things he said that he wished went differently are, well, one, uh, in North Carolina, which a lot of Democrats and even some Republicans thought would go blue, uh, ended up staying with the incumbent, Senator Tom Tillis, uh, because, as Schumer said, quote, Cunningham couldn't keep his zipper up. And that's something, the zipper comment is something that he's made on several calls with donors and referencing, of course, uh, the candidate Cal Cunningham in North Carolina, his extramarital uh, relations. Um, he also mentioned that he wished he had been successfully able to recruit Stacey Abrams in Georgia to run for Senate. Stacey Abrams was a massive uh, mobilizing factor for Democrats in the state. She's clearly a huge party figure there and will continue to be. But uh, Senator Schumer's made clear he wished that she had run. He makes it clear in continuing in these donor calls. Uh, and instead, uh, they both supported uh, Mr. Raphael Warnock, who is running in one of these runoffs against Senator Kelly Loeffler. Uh, he also mentioned 
the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in these calls. And that's really because it paved the way for the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett, but even more so uh, Senator Susan Collins, who was facing a really hard challenge in Maine against Democrat Sarah Gideon. Uh, she was able to kind of diffuse some of the tension from her previous vote to confirm Brett Kavanaugh by saying that she would not confirm any of the president's nominees for the Supreme Court prior to the election. These are some of the reasons that Chuck Schumer, at least, believes led to Senates to not be able to take back the majority. Of course, there's still a shot. The shot is that it would be that 50-50 split if Democrats do win in both of those Senate runoffs in January in Georgia. Uh, but it's hard to know now what the outcome will be. Yeah. Uh, so, Ed, on the pandemic, CBS News has learned that the Biden team has spoken with Dr. Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert and a member of the Trump White House's coronavirus task force. What do we know about communication between the Trump and Biden teams overall as the president continues to deny his loss? Well, we know that at this point, given that the transition has officially underway because Biden's victory was ascertained by the General Services Administration, that the agencies are talking to the transition teams. And so at this point, uh, Dr. Fauci signaled uh, that he has spoken with senior members of the transition team, with Ron Klain, somebody he used to work with uh, during the Obama years when Klain was responsible for overseeing the, the Ebola outbreak across the world. And Fauci was, of course, involved in trying to tackle that. So it, it, that's mostly a good sign that this is happening. Remember, Dr. Burks. Uh, Deborah Burks told our Margaret Brennan on Face the Nation on Sunday that there were going to be conversations yesterday between the Biden team and her office about what they're doing so that they could get a sense of start sharing information essentially about how they're tracking the, the disease, uh, how they're working on the vaccine efforts as well. We've heard nothing publicly from the Biden team since that ascertainment about 10 days ago now that suggests that information is being held back. And so as long as we don't hear anything that's a signal that they're starting to learn what they need to learn. What will be interesting is to what extent do we get a signal at some point that the Biden team either plans to continue this operation warp speed that the Pentagon has been putting in place to distribute the vaccine across the country or modify it, accelerate it, amplify it in some way or scratch it entirely and put in something else. At this point, we haven't heard about that happening, but it'll be curious to see if we get closer to inauguration day and as potentially the vaccine is then being distributed, at least in limited supply, to some parts of the population across the country, whether the Biden team plans to make any big change. Remember, one of the things that happens in these situations during transitions, during changes in government, when new guys come in, is they like to just make change for the sake of change. And it'll be a very interesting signal if for some reason the transition team says to the new administration, keep doing what they were doing because it makes sense, or take what they're doing and expand on it and make it better, or just make it, you know, a faster process. That'll be a real interesting uh, signal as to how well at least an outside team, the transition looking in, thought that this was being put together. Yeah, it will be fascinating to watch that. All right, Ed O'Keefe and Elena Treen, thank you very much.